Hey, Diego. Um, is this on? Is it working good? Okay. Are we online? I want to welcome all of our online viewers. Uh, I have missed everyone. Uh, we've been out for a couple of weeks, and I want to thank uh, Brother Rudy. I want to thank Brother Mark for stepping in and uh, bringing some wonderful uh, messages. Uh, of course, I, I expected no less from, from my brothers. Uh, they're fantastic preachers, and I want to thank them publicly for their faithfulness. Uh, I also want to thank all of the leaders for uh, running the smooth ship, uh, especially uh, uh, Stephen and Veronica and uh, Val and Jackie, our, our, our two deacons and their wives who have done such a, an amazing job. Uh, the Ortizes will be out this week. Uh, I pray they have a restful vacation and that they have travel mercies. And so, again, I'm thankful for that. Brother Kirk, we're, we're continuing to pray for you. We just finished praying for you. And uh, we love you. And we know that uh, you continue to to fight every day for your recovery. We pray for you as you do. And uh, to the Alvarado family, I know that Philip is watching. I want to let you know we pray for you as well. And uh, we uh, pray that you uh, recover as well. And uh, with that being said, uh, we are in our series on interwoven, and we are now in lesson 10. I've got an announcement to make. There are 12 lessons in interwoven. That means that after tonight's study, I've got two more lessons before the series of interwoven comes to an end. And I was praying about where to go from after interwoven. And I have decided to let you decide. So what I would like for you to do, what I'd like for you to do uh, is, uh, for those of you that are watching online, um, to send me a note. And if you want to do it tonight, if you want to send it, or if you want to reach out to me, uh, for those of you here, I would like to hear your input on what you would like the next series to be. That you'd like it to be out of the book of, a book of the Bible, um, let me know your thoughts. If you'd like it to be on a certain topic, let me know your thoughts. I want to be more, um, in, 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 especially for our Wednesday night, Wednesday night study, um, I want to give you a voice. Uh, a lot of times, uh, it's the folks that are receiving the teaching that can oftentimes uh, lead me in that. So uh, I prayed on that, and I, I felt like, no, you know what? I want, to, I want to give the church a chance to do so. So if you're watching online, if you're here tonight, if you have an idea, do not leave or don't click off until you've uh, shared uh, if you have a certain study or a certain topic you'd like to study. Um, so we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be sending the same message next week and uh, give, give you a couple of weeks to decide what you would like uh, the next series to be. So just keep that in mind. All right. With that being said, I want to, um, I want to call a special person up here. I want to call Alexia up here. Come on up here. Look, first of all, before we begin, show everybody your fingernails. Look how pretty your fingernails are. You got to show them like this. She's got her fingernails painted. So I was walking by, and I saw this real pretty picture. And I asked Steve, who did that picture? And he said, you did it. Did you draw this picture? Okay, tell us about this picture. What is this picture? Okay, Jackie's singing. Sister Sarah. And then this is mommy. Okay, so you have your mommy, you have Sister Sarah, and you have Sister Jackie singing, and they have their hands up. Why do they have their hands up? What are they doing? Because they're worshiping. Because they're worshiping. I love that. And so it's a really pretty picture, and I love it. And the reason I love it is because of this. We uh, can't forget that we're setting a standard for our kids. We're setting a standard, for, a standard for others. She sees us worshiping. She now learns how to worship. It's our duty to teach our kids how to worship. It's our duty to teach our loved ones how to worship. Mm -hmm. And that's why the nation of, of Israel has survived for thousands and thousands of years. Because the, the grandpas taught the, the, the grandkids and, the, and their kids and the, and the parents taught their kids how to worship. So every family taught their kids about God. And so just as your mommy and daddy have taught you about Jesus and how to worship, one day you're going to be a mommy, and you're going to teach your kids about how to worship God. So I love your picture because it's really pretty. Did you color it too? I love it. So I'm going to put it back up there for everybody to see, okay? So I'm going to put it up there in the wall. And by the way, we have a little wall where the kids put all their work out there. Don't just walk by. Come by and take a look at it because our kids are doing amazing work there. And so, uh, thank you. I'm going to put this back up there, okay? Thank you. Let me have a hug. 
you did a good job. All right. We, uh, we cannot overlook what our kids are doing. Our kids do an amazing work. Uh, our young kids, our young generation, uh, they are an inspiration to me, and so I wanted to take the time to do that. So, all right. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles with you, let's get started. Lesson 10, Interwoven. The, the, uh, the title of tonight's study is Investing in Others, and it'll make more sense as I begin uh, uh, getting into this study. We uh, are going to be uh, starting out of the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 to 17. Matthew 18, 15 to 17. And tonight's study is both an interesting and a very important topic, investing in others. Now, this title is very intentional. I use the word investing for a very uh, practical purpose. What do I mean by investing in others? Let me give you the definition. When I say investing, I need to give you the definition. This is the definition that I'm, that I'm giving to you, okay? Investing is the expenditure of resources that you have, which is your time, your money, your energy, whatever you have, into something or someone for a benefit. And of course, in this case, in our study of interwoven, it's relationships. So when I say investing in others, it means giving of yourself to someone else, giving whether it be your time, your money, your energy, whatever it is, your prayers, whatever it is, uh, investing in relationships with others. And this is critical for your ability to be able to foster very healthy relationships. And as I go through this, you're going to see what I mean. Okay. And again, as always, I want to uh, remind our online group, we got somebody monitoring. If you have a question or comment, please, uh, please, uh, uh, chime in. Remember this. Every relationship consists of positive or negative experiences. Okay? It doesn't matter uh, who your relationship that you have with someone. Chances are you've never had just nothing but positive or nothing but negative. Now, it may be. But in most relationships, think of somebody important in your life right now. Just think of somebody. It could be a child. It could be a brother, a sister, a sibling, a parent. It could be a friend. And you can and ask yourself, does everybody have somebody in their mind? Think of somebody. Okay. Can you think of positive experiences with them? Do you say, man, I can think of some really happy, good experiences and memories. Can you think of some disappointing times? Some times where you're like, not so good. Okay. That's human experience, right? Well, I want you to imagine relationships as bank accounts, okay? I want you to imagine your relationships as bank accounts, and it's gonna make sense why I say investing in others. Uh, Steve, go to the next slide. Okay, now the credit for this idea goes to a man named Stephen Covey. And years ago, Stephen Covey, an author, wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he introduced this idea of emotional bank accounts. Now, I'm adjusting it a little bit because I don't fully agree with everything he taught. Uh, it's a good idea. I love the premise of what he's teaching. But in Covey's book, what he's talking about is if you want to be highly effective in, 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 in many ways, he's talking about business and so forth, right? He's saying investing in your relationships is, is very critical to your success. Amen. That's great. But the motive for the secular person is different than the Christian person. Wouldn't you agree? The, the motive for the secular person, the businessman, is I'm going to be nice to you. I'm going to invest in you because I get something in return. For the Christian, if we follow the premises of Christ, our motive has nothing to do with what we get. Our motive is the forgiveness that God has given us. And we are reciprocating the love of Christ that is in us that if we say, Jesus lives in me, really he does? Uh, my, my roots are in Christ, really he is? Then therefore, all the fruits that you are bearing should show evidence of that, which goes exactly to what uh, Stephen's uh, study was last week, which was an amazing study, by the way, we tuned in, the fruits of the Spirit. Listen, those fruits of the Spirit, I love how he connected it with, um, with, with this interwoven series. Where else do we practice the, the fruits of the Spirit? Where else do we practice love and forgiveness and peace and kindness and all those things, if not with each other? So Stephen Covey taught this idea. 
He says, think of relationships like bank accounts. And this is the part that I agree with. He says, if you think of them as emotional bank accounts, imagine each of your relationship is a bank account, okay? So you meet somebody for the first time. Hi, Bob, uh, this is Jack. Uh, Jack, this is Bob. Hey, Bob, hey, Jack. When they begin and they introduce each other, they develop, a, uh, they get to know each other, a bank account is now open. Now there's zero account there, okay? It's, it's a new bank account. As they begin to talk and interact, let's say Jack invites Bob over for breakfast the next day. Well, that's, that's maybe a $10 deposit because he invited him, he showed him, hey, you know what, I love this conversation, I'd like to know more about you. Well, he's showing interest in him. Yeah, so they go and they sit down, and then let's say they're in a conversation, there's a great conversation, and, and he listens, and they interact, and he inspires this, uh, Bob inspires Jack, and so forth. And as they spend time together, there's deposits being made in that account. Then they decide a couple weeks later, they text each other every now and then, and with each text, let's say it's a $10 deposit in that account. And then Jack says, hey, Bob, let's go fishing. They go fishing, spend some time out there talking, and then Bob invites Jack over to church, and they go. And over time, each one of those positive interactions, if you see it as a bank account, is like a deposit made into that account. So um, look at it this way. Look at, look at this uh, list. And for those of you online, I'm going to read it for you. On the left side, here's some examples of deposits that are made in your relationships, uh, keeping your promises. Let's say Jack invites Bob over for breakfast. And uh, Bob says, yeah, I'll be there. But Jack shows up the next day for breakfast, and Bob doesn't show up. Is that a deposit or a withdrawal? withdrawal. withdrawal. Now, instead of money being deposited, now there's money removed. See how it works? So keeping your promises, if you say, I promise, if you say this is your word, remember, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So imagine you say something and you go through with it. That's a deposit. Let's say um, you're kind to people, you're courteous of people. Let's say you clarify expectations. In other words, you are genuine with people. You're honest with people. Every time you interact with people, you're making deposits like this. Um, you're loyal. Let's say you're loyal to, to, to people. Uh, you don't stab people in the back. Uh, you are acknowledging of other people. You're, you're considerate, you're respectful. When you mess up, when you make a mistake, that's a withdrawal, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're quick to come back and say, hey, Jack, I'm sorry. Um, I know we were supposed to meet at 8, and I know it's 8.20. I'm very sorry this is what happened. An apology is a deposit. When you make an apology, when you make amends for what you've done, that's a deposit, okay? So now maybe let's say you're disappointed because so-and-so let you down, but then they sincerely apologize, sincerely. Then, then that can make up for it. Another one is being open to feedback. Let's say the person is genuine open to you and, and you speak to them and they listen to you, they acknowledge your feelings. These are all deposits in a relationship. Now look at the withdrawals. If you constantly break your promises, you're not dependable. You say one thing, but you really didn't. Sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. Those are all withdrawals. Uh, you're unkind. You say unkind words. You are insulting sometimes. You, you're, you're not respectful of the way you treat people. Uh, you're disloyal, you gossip about them, you're prideful, you're arrogant, you're defensive, uh, you gaslight people, you, make, you blame others for your own mistakes and try to make them feel guilty for it. Uh, you place blame on others, you violate expectations. All of these are withdrawals. So what will happen over time if a relationship is mostly positive? Not perfect. But what will happen if over time a relationship is mostly positive? You're going to look at that bank account of that relationship and say, wow, I've got $38,950 in there. Wow, that's a lot of text messages and, 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 and uh, compliments. And I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to spend time with you and so forth. Okay, now, what will happen to a relationship over time if it's mostly negative? Withdrawals. You're going to close the account. That's it. That's exactly right. That's exactly it. You're going to close the account. So now understand something. Serious, loving relationships will never be completely without withdrawals. You know why? You know how I know? Because you're not perfect. And they're not perfect either. 
So no matter who you are, look, my wife and I, when we met, I asked her out and we went on a date and we went on more dates. Every one of those dates, every, every hour that we spent in the dating mode before I asked her to marry me, they were investments. We got to know each other. We would share a laugh, and I would ask questions about her life, and she would ask me, and we got to know each other. She got to know about my family. I got to know about hers, and then I got to find out what she liked and what she didn't like, and if I was paying attention, I was making sure that I was accommodating to who she was. Now, somewhere along the line, I had to make a decision. Is this the person that I want to be with for the rest of my life? When I made the decision, yes, this is the woman, the kind of woman I want to marry, what happened to the priority of that account? I may have had a lot of things going on in my life, but I thought not many things more important than my relationship with probably the most important girl in my life. But what happens to people when they say, oh, this person's important to me, but everything that they show and do is completely opposite of that. So all of these things are a key to your success in your relationships. So the point I'm trying to make is this. When people keep their promises, they're kind, they're courteous, they're respectful, they pray for others, they're acknowledging, they show the love of Christ. These kinds of people are constantly making deposits in other people's lives. Now, what is that person's life going to look like? The kind of person that exhibits the love of Christ in others. If you really put on the love of God, remember, you don't have it, I don't have it. We have to put it on every day because it doesn't come from us. It comes from the Spirit of Christ that's been given to us. We put that on and every day we're smiling at people. We're praying for people. We're forgiving people who've offended us. We show grace. We show mercy. And we show this love to people. Over time, that person is going to be blessed with positive accounts. But have you seen, have you ever met people that are genuinely defensive and arrogant and rude and they don't keep their promises and they make excuses for what they do? You look around their life and they're like, oh, and they go, I wonder my, why my relationships are not so good. And they'll blame everybody else. But they can't see who they are and what they're doing. And you know what happens? Those people find themselves alone. Or they find themselves losing very important relationships in their life. And then they find themselves walking around with regret because they have lost what is too late that, to regain back again. These are the things that are critical if you want to live an interwoven life. If you and I are interwoven, you have to ask yourself, in my day, in my life, how do I, how do I spend my time? Do I invest in others? Do others invest in me? Do I show the love of Christ? Do I make deposits in relationships? Or am I a taker? Am I a disappointer? Am I a, a, a person that withdraws from others to the point that now I'm suffering in my relationships in my life? So these are the things that you have to examine in your life if you really want to find yourself in healthy relationships. What happens when couples stop investing in each other? What happens, for example, my wife and I, we went through this phase. Remember the dating phase? We were going out and man, we'd go get ice cream and man, she was the most important thing in my life and everything was going great. Then she gets pregnant with Marco, and then I have to go get a job, and i got to you know, make money to, to pay the rent and pay the utilities and to pay the car and to pay the insurance and the telephone and all that stuff. And Monty is busy trying to work and trying to raise the kid and trying to do all these things. And after a while, we stop investing in each other. After a while, we don't go on dates anymore. We don't have time to... Uh, I remember when we were first dating, we would stay up late just talking about different stuff. Well, I'm getting home late. I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. She wants to go to sleep. After a while, you're so you're so caught up with life. You're so caught up with the kids. The kids, they, they get all your energy. They get all your time that you don't have any time for each other. That happened to me and Madi. And after, after a couple of years, three years, it felt like I was living with the roommate rather than with the spouse. The conversation ceased that when we finally did go out on dates and we would sit there, we didn't have anything to talk about. We'd be like, yeah, so we were talking about the kids because we had nothing to share anymore. And I, when I began to realize that, I thought, we have to invest in each other again. And when Madi and I began to talk with couples that are in crisis, that's one of the key things. We'll hear one of the spouses say, well, 
you know, there was a time, man, when we were so good. We were uh, spending time together. Things were so great. But lately, I feel like we just don't talk to each other anymore. We, we don't connect. We don't understand each other anymore. And the first thing we'll say, Monty and I will tell them, you need to reinvest in each other again. Y'all are the most important relationship in that household, and you've allowed life to get in the way. And you have to make time. Don't You can't, well, we'll see when there's time. There isn't going to be time. You're going to have to make time for each other. And if that relationship is that important, you have to do that. So what happens, for example, when parents are consistently critical or break their promises with their kids? You see, a lot of times parents think, well, you know, I'm mom or I'm dad, and that we have this, this unlimited bank account with our kids. But if you're constantly critical to your kids, if you're constantly breaking your promises to your kids, if you're not investing time in your kids, eventually your kids are going to close down that account with you. There comes a point where they just shut down on you. And then you're trying to make things right with them. But what you realize is, is you have a negative balance. And when you try to do it with your spouse, if you haven't invested in the time, if you try to do it with, with people who are important in your life, and you're trying to make things right, and you don't realize, I have a negative balance, then you're going to struggle to understand what's happened to your relationship. It needs time. It needs investment. It needs energy. It needs your focus. And so many times I've seen parents, for example, they try to buy their way with the kids. They'll say, well, I'm going to buy them this or whatever to make up where they're lacking. But your kid doesn't need an extra teddy bear. They don't need an extra game. They need time with their parents. They need a hug from their parents. They need a day with their parents. They need a conversation with their parents. They need connection with their parents. The same thing with husbands and wives. So what happens when people do not value or respect their relationships? They're going to look around and they're going to see closed bank accounts, negative balances. And this is why it's so important to understand the idea of investing in others. Okay, so, so that's the introduction. Let me open it up for a conversation. In what way in your life or in what way from what you've heard me say, and I, I welcome the online comments as well, in what way do you think this is critical or important for you and your relationships or for you to have success? It, share some things. Give me your thoughts of what you've heard. The legacy they leave behind, right? Right. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no, that was it. Yeah, you're right because, how can I put this? We have to think about what's more valuable for us, right? We have people chasing uh, titles and money and all kinds of different things. But for those of us who walk with Christ, we realize that if we really believe what the scriptures tell us, the things that are most valuable to us are our relationships around us, our kids, uh, our spouses, our relationship with God. And if you walk and talk and act in the way that Jesus did, for three and a half years, Jesus did nothing but invest in others. And the world was changed forever after that. But we, we care so little for oftentimes the relationships that we have that we're not even, we're not even realizing uh, the damage that we're doing in our relationships. Just withdraw, withdraw, withdraw. And it's so easy, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And we expect the account to stay the same. No. Every time you disappoint, every time you break a promise, every time you fail, what you're sending is a message. You're not that important. Yeah. Oh, but you're so important to me. Then why isn't it there? Yeah. Why isn't the fruit there? Why isn't the evidence there? You have to be willing to do those things. And I'm speaking especially to, uh, to couples, to, uh, to marriages out there, uh, parents and the children. And I'm also speaking to the church across the board. Uh, we have to be that way with one another, where Paul tells us to be patient and enduring with one another. We have to invest in each other. You know what that's called? It's called discipleship. Mm -hmm. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, mm -hmm. baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you. In other words, the primary directive 
in the, uh, in the gospel commission, the great commission, is discipleship, not baptism. That's where a lot of churches have gotten it wrong. Go up there, baptize them, and then good luck to you. No, it's the investment in the individual. This church, New Spirit Church, may never be a mega church. But what I hope is that the people who are here have people invested in them, and they're invested in others. What I hope is that when I look around, I see healthy relationships. I see people who are strong in their faith. I see people who are secure in their relationship with Christ. That to me is more important. And, and I'm not saying that a larger church is not, is not important. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, is I would far better feel as a pastor if I had a smaller flock of healthy people with healthy relationships, and especially in the relationship with God, than a bunch of people who were not doing or living out anything of the faith that they proclaim. So all of this is, this isn't just some idea. This is biblically based, and I'll prove it to you. Uh, Matthew 18, 15 to 17. If you have your Bibles with you, Matthew 18, 15 to 17, and that's in the next slide. There you go, brother. Remember, here's the key teaching for tonight. You have to invest in your relationships. Think of somebody that's important in your relationship. Think of somebody right now and say, this person is important to me. How are, you, how are you investing your time, your energy, your focus, and your love to that relationship? Does it, Are you investing in that relationship? And you have to guard against too many withdrawals. And let me tell you something. Uh, there are no relationships out there that can't get to a negative balance if you're not careful. And, there, and, and so that's the key here. Listen to what happens here in Matthew 18, 15 to 17. This is, this is Jesus speaking. And this is his instruction for relationships in the church. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Okay, so notice if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Okay, there's an offense. There was a withdrawal made. Now Jesus is saying, respond, be, be proactive with that withdrawal. Somebody's offended you. Somebody's hurt you. Somebody's done something wrong. Go and try to make amends there, right? Now, but if he doesn't listen, verse 16, if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. He says, okay, if they're not willing to listen, take with you two or three and attempt again. It's a priority. Relationships are priority. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. I want you to read this through the lens of emotional bank accounts. So here we see attempts to reconcile withdrawals, but when others are unrepentant, unwilling to change, unwilling to, to, to see and acknowledge their mistakes, we have to be willing to close some accounts. That's what Jesus is saying, just like you said, sister. There are some people who will do damage to your life and they'll do damage to others around you if they're left unrestrained. That's what Jesus is saying. So there's been times in my life, and even as a pastor, where I've had to practice that right there, where I've had to deal with people who are unrepentant, 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 and then for the sake of the flock and for the sake of others, I have to say, okay, what is best to do now? Is Jesus being serious here? Is, does he mean what he say? Yes, he does. Um, so Jesus' words are very clear here. Have nothing to do with them. That's what it meant to be a Gentile and a tax collector. You, know, you stayed away from them. Now, of course, you might say, but wait a minute. Wasn't Matthew a tax collector? Didn't he reach out to them? Yes. He's not saying that, that uh, we're supposed to judge others. What he's saying is, he's speaking to Jews here. He's saying, what do you do with Gentiles and tax collectors? He goes, well, we avoid them. He says, you've got to keep some people in the distance. But when it comes to preaching the gospel, you reach it out to everybody. And if people are responsive, then you invest. If people are not responsive, then you don't. So, because people have looked at this and they said, how does this square with the command to forgive others? I thought Jesus said to forgive. Uh, all of a sudden here, he's saying if, if people are unrepentant. If you notice verses 21 to 22 of Matthew 18, that same verse, after he tells us this, you notice it says, um, he tells Peter, how many times sh uh, should I forgive if a brother sins against me? He says, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. So Jesus is talking about being consistently forgiving, right? But does this mean that we should not uh, ever allow withdrawals to, to, to be retained in our relationships? Should we allow people in our lives to consistently withdraw from us? 
consistently take advantage of us, consistently lie to us, consistently make promises that they never keep? No. It's a reminder to not let offenses overshadow our relationships. In other words, don't allow grudges to get in, to set in. You got to be careful who you allow into your life. So let me bring it into perspective. Go to Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. Am I going too fast? Okay. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. You're just excited about us. I do get excited. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. Put on then, you see that putting on again like a garment? Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. Now, y'all tell me, what does that mean? What do you think Paul means in, in Colossians here in verse 13, bearing with one another? He's talking about relationships with the church. What does it mean by bearing with one another? He's talking about relationships like at home. He's talking about the important relationships. Understanding our, um, each other's imperfections. That's a great way to put it. In other words, sometimes you have to put up with each other. Yeah. You have to put up with each other. That's really what he's saying. Sometimes you have to put up with like you, you look and you see that imperfection. I like how you put it. You have to, I, I know Steve. Yeah, I know. Bless you, sister. You're going to get a major crown in heaven. for. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, sometimes you, you see that imperfection. You go like, man, I see it. But you know what? I'm going to show grace and mercy. My poor wife, she's, she's become a master at it. She really needs to thank me. Because thanks to me, she's learned how to be compassionate and patient and forgiving. Right? I mean, if I was this perfect, nice husband, she, she wouldn't have had a chance to practice it. So, Steve, kudos to you, man. You're, you're, you're helping to shape and forge your wife. She should thank you. Thanks to you and your imperfections, she's a stronger, more forgiving, compassionate woman, right? Um, but yeah, it means putting up with one another sometimes. It means, yeah, I see that. I, it, I don't like what I see. But because my love for you is, is greater than this thing, uh, I'm going to bear with it, right? But now, let's keep going in verse 13. If one has a complaint against another, what does it say? Forgiving each other. Forgiving. It's not one and done. Forgiving is continuous, right? As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. There's the basis, there's the motivation for your forgiveness and your compassion and your mercy with other people. Why do you put up with so-and-so? Why did you forgive so-and-so? Because God did it for me. Amen. Why do you bear up with them? Because Christ did it for me. That's where I, I'm a little bit different than Stephen Covey because even though the concept is good, we're not secularists. We're Christians. And the difference is, is that all of our motivations are based on what Christ has done for us. I do this not because I expect something in return. I don't put money in the pot because I expect a big check later. I don't uh, act nice to others because I think they'll give me something in return. I do, it, I do it because Christ did it for me. Doing it without any expectation in return. That's the love of Christ. So the command to forgive others is an instruction to practice the forgiveness that we've already received from God. But this teaching in Colossians and this teaching of forgiveness is not an excuse to allow others to abuse us. This teaching in Colossians about bearing with one another and forgiving and so forth is not an excuse to allow others to abuse you. My wife and I unfortunately have found ourselves in situations where we're dealing with couples in which abuse is happening uh, in, in different forms. No, you have to get out of that context. Now, <clears throat> it doesn't mean, yes, we teach forgiveness. Yes, we teach, hey, God hates divorce. Yes, we teach, these are difficulty, uh, the difficult things that we have to deal with. God doesn't want divorce, right? God wants to restore relationships and so forth. But that does not mean that the person should be sitting there in a situation where they're constantly abused. Get out of there. And we'll be praying, and sometimes it's good for people to separate. Uh, Paul speaks of that. It's good for people to separate and for, for repentance and for, for time and so forth. Um, but these teachings uh, are not an excuse to allow people to take advantage of you. That, that's, that's, not, uh, that's not what it's teaching. So we must always love and forgive. But there are some people we have to love from a distance. 
there are some people we have to keep at a distance. Not every relationship is good for you. Let me repeat that again. Not every relationship is good for you. In fact, when you become a Christian, you may have some hard decisions to make about who needs to be near you. There are some people that are not good for you. It may be family members. It may be old friends of the old ways, of the old life. You have some decisions to make. So look at it this way. Jesus did not invest in everyone. Jesus didn't invest in everyone. Were there people that Jesus didn't invest his time in and his energy with? Yeah. Were there people that he didn't? Like who? The Pharisees. The Pharisees. You don't see Jesus going to the Pharisees, okay, please believe me, look, let me make my case so you can... Their, their hearts were far from him. They weren't worth his time. And now listen, for me as a pastor too, there are some people that may question and may ask questions and want to learn. If they really want to learn, I'll invest. But sometimes people are questioning and challenging because they have a different spirit. And you have to see those things. Jesus did not invest in Pharisees. Jesus did not invest in unbelievers and people who rejected him. And Jesus did not invest in critics. But how would you explain to the critics who say, well, he invested in Judas? What say it again. How, what would you say to the critics who say, well, he invested in Judas? He was his disciple for three yeah. years. And yet he came out being a bad investment. Interesting that you bring up Judas because I am writing a paper right now, an academic paper that I'm going to submit to the University of Edinburgh. Please keep me in prayer. I'm going to be busy on this paper for the next three or four months. Exactly on that question because that's a brilliant question. That's a question that I actually address. Why did Jesus invest in Judas knowing that at the end of the day it wouldn't produce the fruit, right? Uh, there's three things that I think John, because I'm bringing it from the fourth gospel. There's three things that I would say to that. Number one, Jesus knew the hearts of men. If you look at John chapter 6, he says, Did I not choose you 12, and yet one of you is a devil, diabolos. He, he calls Judas a devil. He knows what he's up to from the beginning. So why does Jesus invest in him, right? Because when he washes feet, Judas is there. He washes Judas' feet knowing he's going to betray him. But is there a message to the Christian Okay, so killing him with kindness. Here's a person that followed Jesus, saw all of the miracles, heard all of the preaching, and at the end betrayed him. So there were people that were questioning, did Jesus really know? Was he really divine? And the answer is absolutely he knew. But it was part of God's providence. It's part of God's divine plan. It would be through him that God would accomplish good. For those who may intend for bad, God uses for good, for the purpose of those who are called according to his to his measure, to his purpose. Jesus still had to be Jesus, right? Yes. And at the same time, uh, Judas did, uh, Judas was there because you know, Jesus knew what had to happen, right? And, yeah. and I think that Judas was that key player. Granted, he betrayed him, but he was the key to Jesus dying on the cross. Yeah, actually, and that's my biggest argument in this paper. So I said there were three. The first one is, Jesus does know who he is, but he, but he knows that God will use him according to his purpose. The second thing is this. What would it say about Jesus' ministry if on the onset he says, mm, not you, but I want to follow you. Not you, not you, not you, but, but these people already know their hearts are going to follow me. From the onset, what it would have shown is a limited ministry. So Jesus' ministry was to the world, for God so loved the world, that he died for the world so that those may choose whether to reject him or accept him. So I like how, I may actually steal that from you, Steve. I like that the way you said that. I'll give credit to you. Spoken by Steve Lanza. Um, <laughs> Jesus had to be Jesus. No, but you're right. Because Jesus was, uh, was the love to the world. He allowed people to approach him or reject him or decide on their own. Jesus never infringed upon free will. Each person, each individual was free to reject him or, or, or to believe in him, and he never infringed upon that. But, but he allowed him to be within his group, within his discipleship, for a unique purpose and for that reason. Now, the third one, and this is the big one. When you look, there was a, a, there was a Gnostic writing called the Gospel of Judas that was written about 50 years afterwards. Uh, this is kind of getting more into academics. There were known as Sethian uh, Gnostics. They looked at Judas as a um, tragic figure. 
So they didn't see him as the evil villain, you know, who was going to betray Jesus. Instead, he was this guy who, who betrayed Jesus because he wasn't who he thought he was. And so, you know, he was thinking he was going to be the messianic uh, Messiah, you know, the, the, I mean, the, Jew, uh, the Jewish Messiah. And when he didn't come out the way he expected him to be, the Davidic um, uh, fulfillment, that he, you know, he turned him in only later to be repentant. So he's this poor, tragic figure. And John is correcting that. No, he's not a poor, tragic figure. He made his decisions from the start. When he goes to the Pharisees to try to find redemption, it speaks wonders there. Peter messes up just as much as Judas. On Friday, Peter and Judas are in the same boat. They both messed up. Peter has denied Jesus three times. Judas has betrayed his master. They're both in the same boat. The difference is that Peter stuck around. He remembered the promise, and he went to Jesus to find redemption. Judas went to find redemption with who? With the Pharisees. And what do they say? What is it to us if you've betrayed innocent blood? So he went to the wrong place to find redemption. And that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. So Jesus allows, and this is my third point, to go along with the, the Lanza uh, comment here. Jesus allows Judas to be who Judas is and to remain with them as a semblance, as a part of his message. Because of what he does and how he shows, we're able to see Peter in a different light because he stood in contrast with, with Judas. Peter shines more because of Judas on the dark side. You know, and so what you see is two contrasting figures, and so in many ways, Jesus, knowing his heart, still used him used him as an element of example for his ministry, and it's a message to us even today. So that's my opinion. But I mean, I can, I'm going to talk a lot more about it because as I start working on this paper, I'm actually going to bring you a summary of it. But I, I love your question because because even though Jesus didn't invest in those who rejected him. Jesus had a purpose for, for, for Judas. That's my point. Judas chose to follow him, and, Judas, and Jesus allowed it because he had a purpose for him, knowing full well that he would betray him at the end. And that's my opinion. You know, So that's a great question. I think the key portion there is what you said, is that the difference was that Peter knew the, knew the solution. He knew to go back. To he knew where to go yes, and what to that, do. That, I think that's the main thing Yeah. There, because Judas, it's just like, in the world, right, where they go to other things other than Christ, just to simplify it. Yeah, you know, and I had a message on that. Uh, this was years ago when I brought it, I can't remember, but uh, that was the message. Where do you go for redemption? Because uh, you, maybe you're not going to the right place. You know, we're trying to find redemption with different things. Some people try to find redemption with their dads who never approved of them, or with their friends who they want to impress, or with the world because the world is so important to them. Where do you find redemption? Where do you find fulfillment? Uh, Peter went to the right place. He went to Christ. And there he was restored three times. He denied him three times in the reinstatement. Jesus re restores him. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. You know, feed my sheep. So three times, three times, uh, Judas went to the wrong place. So I think that Judas stands as a testament of, uh, and, and uh, in my socio rhetorical studies, I call him the voice of apostasy. That, and the example, and I think that this is a great example that, that Judas represents to us. Judas is evidence that you can walk with Jesus, listen to Jesus, see Jesus do all these great things, and yet find yourself on the wrong place. Because it doesn't matter if you hear it and you see it and you witness it, if you don't believe it in your heart. Yeah. Judas never believed. He never received Jesus here. He never confessed Jesus as the Son of God. And as a result of that, despite all the miracles he saw, and sadly, there's a lot of people who've come to church and they've seen all the great miracles. They've seen prayers answered and so night and day, but yet refuse to believe and receive him. And it's sad to know because Jesus tells us there will be many who will think they'll come to him at the end of days and he'll say, get away from me for I never knew you. And that's, that's sobering. He wanted so, his own Jesus. Say again? He wanted his own Jesus, his version of Jesus. Yeah. A lot of times people want their own version of Jesus, right? So, so if Jesus didn't invest in everyone. So we also need to be careful who we invest in. So here's the point. Here's, so I want to address this. Yes, we're to love and forgive. But some people we have to keep at a distance. We have some people we have a hard decision to make. Are, are, is everyone good for me in my life? And this is the people that I want you to think about. Uh, and again, there may be you know skeletons and 
stuff and hidden secrets in your life, I'm not interested in that. That's between you and God. But I'm giving you uh, things to think about from Scripture for you to take to the Lord. Uh, is everyone in your life good for you? Is everyone that God, you know, that God has put in your life, uh, uh, I, I guess better put is, is everyone in your life, has God put them there? Are they, do they belong there? Yeah. But be careful. There are abusive people. There are narcissists. There are bad friends. Remember, for bad company corrupts good morals. Uh, there's family members. There's bad influences in your life. There are ungodly people, and there are people who will take advantage of you. They won't invest anything in you. They're just there to take, 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 take. And you have to have the wisdom to see that. And remember this. There are some people who may love you. They may genuinely love you and respect you, but they're not in alignment with your life. Maybe they're not walking with Christ. And maybe they're a good friend. Maybe they're a friend from college. Maybe they're a friend from work. And now you can, you can, you can share the gospel. You can be the light. But what do you do when that person says, no, I reject it? And you have a decision to make. And a lot of people, unfortunately, say, I don't want to lose my friend. So with my friend, I'm going to be one way, one version. But with the, but with the church, I'll be another. See, that's, that's a person you have to make a decision about. Um, all of these people that I'm describing, these abusive people, narcissists, bad friends, people who break uh, their promises and uh, don't invest in you and, and, and continuously hurt you, they make primarily withdrawals in your life. And you have to be careful. Now, let's talk about the relationships that are worth investing. Who did Jesus invest in? He didn't invest in the Pharisees and the people who rejected him and didn't believe in him. Who did he invest in? His disciples, primarily Peter, James, and John, the inner circle, right? Now, were there people outside of the disciples that he invested in? Yes. Who? His friends. Who? His friends. Martha, oh. Mary. Okay. The church, I mean, the followers. Martha, Mary. Yeah, right. There was a family in Bethany that he invested in. Uh, who else did you say? Lazarus, right? The, the brother. He sits on a well going through Samaria and some woman that nobody cares about, some woman that nobody wants, some woman that the village has outcast, he waits for her there knowing that she's going to come there to get a, a water. The Samaritan woman. And he invests time with her. As busy as this man is, he could have been sitting down in the palace with kings. Instead, he sits at a well and he waits for a woman that thinks that she's invisible to God. That's the kind of Lord that we serve. Amen. He invested in people that needed him. You know who he invested he in? Didn't know. He invested in you. Mm -hmm. Now, I look around and go, yeah, I, I can see God investing in you. You guys are pretty good. But he invested in me. And that part I struggle with. I, I can see him investing in you guys because y'all are y'all are all right. I, I sometimes struggle, Lord, why did you invest in me? But I, I'm sure some of you feel the same way sometimes too. The fact that God would invest in me is the most humbling thing in the world. And when I see that, I think people who are willing to receive him, lepers, prostitutes, the, 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 the invisibles, the unwanted people in the world, Jesus said, I want them. They're valuable to me. So what about us? What are the relationships worth investing in? Let's go back to what scripture teaches us. Go to Ephesians chapter 4 verses 29 to 32. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 29 to 32. There been any online comments? Um, or questions? A lot of amens. And amens, all right. Well, thank you all for tuning in. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. No corrupting talk. Nothing corruptive. But only such as good for building up others, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't sometimes be critically honest. I mean, sometimes sometimes you don't just need to hear, yeah, you're doing good. Sometimes you're not doing good. And sometimes you need to hear that. My, my wife ain't going to just tell me I'm doing good if I'm not doing good. She's like, hey, you can do better. You know, um, so 
In fact, the people that love you most are going to be the most honest with you. Uh, verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, y'all remember that little thing that I told you about? The body, the soul, which is made up of the mind and the heart, the will, the way we behave and think and so forth. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, which seals us, right? When we act and think, when our soul goes contrary to what the Holy Spirit wants, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's what it's saying there. Um, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Get rid of those things along with all malice. That's hatred, negativity, insult, anger, all that stuff, right? Verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And there it is again. Here's your motive for it. As God in Christ forgave you. Always reminding you why you do it. Not because they deserve it, because they probably don't. But if, let me tell you something else. If you are in a relationship with somebody who has been consistently forgiving you, you have to come to a point where you realize, is this person, this person must love me if they're consistently forgiving me over and over and over again. That person must be very valuable and that person must be very important to you. And if you're not careful, and if you don't say, my goodness, this person is deserving of every bit of my effort to honor and respect and protect this, I need to make sure that I'm investing in this and I'm protecting against withdrawals. Um, a lot of times, and I know that for me growing up, uh, there were a lot of people that were investing in me that I didn't, uh, that I took for granted. I took, I took people for granted growing up. And those are some of the things that now, looking back, I go, I wish I would have been different. I wish I would have known Christ back then. I wish I would have lived out the, 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 the life of character that God wanted me to live out at this time, at that time. Uh, my parents invested so much and I hope they're, you know, when I see them in heaven, I hope they're, 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 they're proud of what God did with me afterwards. I think they will be, but, but my parents had to put up with a lot with me. My wife has to put up a lot with me, even to this day. There are people that put up with us and you know why they do it? Because they love us. The least they deserve is a better effort, honesty, integrity, keeping our promises, being who we should be. So notice the deposits the scripture teaches. Verse 29, building up others and showing grace. And notice verse 32. This is a perfect scripture about the importance of emotional investment. Being kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving. Notice the motive behind what we do as God in Christ forgave you. So... This study is, is to remind you of this. Look at your relationships in your life with your parents, with your siblings, with your coworkers, with your friends, with your boyfriend or girlfriend, with your spouse, with everybody. everybody. Now, I want you to think of someone in your relationship, one of your relationships that may be strained or may not be where you want it to be, okay? No judgment, this is just between you and God. Think of a relationship that you, if, if, let me put it to you this way, no, no answers out loud. If an angel appeared before you and said, give me the name of the person that you wish you could have a much better relationship with, that you would be blessed with a much healthier relationship, think of the name of the person that you would say. Look at that relationship, and this is what I would challenge you to do. Chances are you've made a lot of withdrawals or they've made withdrawals with you. And that bank account is probably near zero balance or negative. If you hope to restore that relationship, if it's that important, pray on it. And there's two things you need to do. If this relationship is either a relationship worth investing, then now you know what to do. It needs your time, your energy, work. Relationships are work. Or be to them as the Gentiles and the tax collectors. You might have to say, I'm sorry, this pains me, but this relationship, I can't go on with it. Or this relationship, this is what I need to do. If there are relationships in your life that are struggling, you need to invest time. It may be as easy as sending a text message. Hey, I haven't talked to you in a while. How are you doing? Calling them. Uh, hey, you know, you have, uh, you have time for, for, to go meet for a taco or, or have breakfast. Um, they need quality time. They need your energy, your investment. And you need to be make sure that you prioritize that thing. And if it's not, then you need to make a decision there. 
when you look at your relationships around you, you if you look at it from this aspect, your investments, you're going to find that it's going to be a good guide. It's going to be a really healthy guide in a way for you to know how you can build. And every day, my, my wife and I, we've been married 28 years now. Uh, I still have to invest. I still need to sit down and have conversations with her because life changes and we get busy. Uh, my kids, they're growing up. Marco's already moved out of the house. It doesn't mean that I don't invest in time with him and invest in his life. And my daughter, she's 19, same thing. Uh, with the members of, of, of the flock, if somebody's hurting, if somebody's missing, I do my best. I can't be there for everybody all the time, but we have to invest in one another. Uh, so when I heard, like, for example, when Sister Sarah was sick and there were some sisters that reached out and went and spent time with her, that's the love of Christ. So these are the things that will nurture a relationships in the, in the church as well as relationships in your life. Okay, I'll, I'll shut up. Questions, comments? For a non-believer, like when uh, you said that Jesus didn't invest in some people, uh, I would think that they would say, well, like, he should love everybody, and he should invest in everybody. So, I mean, I'm not questioning that no. the reason yeah. why he didn't invest, but I'm just thinking, like, what a non-believer would, you know, like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and those are, those, and, and what I'm, and because this is a hard teaching, people have notions of God or of Jesus that are just simply not because accurate. He's love, he's love. Jesus he's is love, love. he love. just affirms everybody, yes. and no, and, and, and contrary. That's how they think, you know, like, yeah, what. yeah, yeah, and, 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 and people don't know the character of God. Um, so when it comes to the character of Jesus and God, the part that makes people uncomfortable are the, uh, the wrath, the judgment, the 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 consequences of not following him, uh, the the part of self sacrifice and the part of repentance. People don't want to hear that, which is why it's not preached very often. They talk about the affirming and God is a big fluffy teddy bear. Jesus is love. It's just uh -huh. this big encompassing love and loves everybody. But I go mean, back. I kind of made me say it because you know, like I see a lot of the podcasts too, where there's a lot of preachers trying the gospel to the LGBT. BTQ community and they're like well Jesus is love he's supposed to love all of us no, you know like that's why I'm just like yeah. yeah and what I would say to that person is Jesus isn't supposed to do anything uh, Jesus is mm -hmm. he is so it's not he, Jesus is, is not uh, accountable to us Jesus does, it, it doesn't fit into our mold into our expectations Jesus is who he is and we have to learn him at his term we have to meet him at his terms mm -hmm. Um, so people don't like hearing, well, there'll be people that will come to me and say, you know, Jesus, Lord, Lord, and I'll say, get away from me for I never knew you. Wait a minute, I thought Jesus was love. Why would Jesus say that? Because he's saying, no, the love that I speak of is not the love of affirming everything. It's kind of like a parent with a child. You know, if my daughter were to say, hey, dad, um, I've been thinking about it. I've been looking for a hobby. I've decided I'm going to start doing crack cocaine. If it's okay with you, I'd like to do it three times a week. I'll do it in the comfort of my home home. Now, there's going to be people coming in and out because I've decided I'm going to open up my own crack cocaine business, and I'll be selling crack out of the house. And I'll say, well, no, Kayla, you can't do that. It's illegal. Look, look, listen, Dad. I'm your daughter. You love me. You need to love me and accept me for who I am. This is who I identify as now. And if you love me, you say you love me, right, Dad? Well, yeah, I do. Well, then you need to accept me for what I do. And say, no, that's the, the stupidest thing I could ever, you could ever tell me. No, as your father, I do love you, which is exactly why I won't allow you to do that. And if I do find out, you know what? I'll be the first one to call the cops on you. I'll be the first one. I'll call my, I'll call the cops on my own daughter. Say, hey, there's crack cocaine up there, and and I took pictures of it. And here it is. So, people don't want to hear about the accountability to God. You're right. Uh, go back and read how Jesus speaks to the Pharisees. He's not very kind. When you call somebody a den of vipers, a den of serpents. When you, basically, you call them a brood, a group of, 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 of snakes. That's probably not very kind. Um, but, but Jesus knew who he was talking to. When, when Jesus says, you're not of God, your father is the devil. That's probably not very nice, right? You, you, I know you don't belong to, you don't belong, you belong to, the, to the devil. Because Jesus knows who he's talking to. He's talking to people that are unrepentant. Now, he didn't go to the, to the adulterous woman. He didn't go to the leper and call her an adulteress. He says, where's all your accusers? Well, they're not here. Well, neither do I accuse you. 
But Lord, you can. You are. You can pick up the rock because he who is without sin, Lord, you're without sin. But I came so that those who would believe would have life eternal. Yeah. I didn't come to judge the world, but to save it. But when I come back, I will come back as a different, as, in a different light. So you're right. I think that this notion of Jesus and God is just love. Or isn't he love? No, he's not supposed to do anything. He is who he is. And we have to accommodate to him. And I think that the, the, the preachers and the churches have changed it to make Jesus and God more palatable to the world. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that, is the, that, is the, that is the poison that has infiltrated the, the, the church system. It's this gospel that affirms everything. No, uh, God preaches and teaches as much repentance and condemnation and judgment as he does anything else. You know which figure in the Bible speaks more of hell than anybody else? Jesus. Jesus speaks more of hell than anybody else. More than Elijah, more than Ezekiel, more than Jeremiah, anybody. Jesus did. You know why? Because it was that serious. So, yeah. And I think that when we begin to understand that God is, in his character, a God to be feared, a, a God to be submissive to, and a God to surrender to, only then can we understand why all these things that we're called to do uh, won't come to light until we do so. But when we say, you know, I want God to affirm me as I am, like you said, the LGBT community and so forth, what we're saying is, Lord, I want you to let me be who I am, even if it, it leads to death. And no parent would do that. No parent would allow their child to to willing, willingly go into death and applaud it. They would say no. Uh, now, you know, just like we have free will, God will not force us to do anything. But he will speak to us. He will warn us. But if we choose to reject him, just like Judas Judas, go and do what you, what you came to do. Jude, Jesus didn't stop him. He didn't hang on to his hand and say, but please, Judas, believe me, wait, don't go. No. Jesus allowed everyone to make their own choices, but he laid out the consequences too. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great conversation. So any other comments or questions? I'm going to be faithful with the time moving forward because I know with the school season starting, especially with mamas that have got to get their kids ready for school, um, I'm going to be stopping pretty close to about 8.15, 8.20. Uh, so I'm going to be trying to be more mindful of that. Uh, so um, again, uh, remember the teaching in here. Look, Examine your relationships and ask yourself, can I be better at the way I treat them? If you begin to examine them as investments and withdrawals, I think it will make us a little bit more, more faithful to the way we treat others. Let's love people. Let's be, let's be depositors. So um, two more lessons. Remember what I said at the beginning of the study. I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, after we finish this study in two weeks, um, I want your voices to speak on what studies you'd like to hear. So give me your thoughts. I'd love to hear them. Let's go to the Lord. Lord Father, thank you for this study, and thank you for all that was shared. Lord, a reminder, Lord Father, of the importance of investing in others. Lord, you call us to be compassionate, to put on grace and mercy and love and forgiveness, and Lord, to understand that in our relationships, Lord Father, there have been some relationships, Lord Father, that we have faltered and failed to protect and take care of. Lord, uh, forgive us for that and for those relationships that have gotten low in their bank accounts, Lord Father. Lord, uh, convict us and reveal to us to be better in that, that those relationships that are indeed worthy and important, that we invest in them and protect them accordingly. And Lord, for those relationships that you call us to, to reconsider, Lord, show us, Lord Father, that we prune our lives and, and understand that that only certain people should be within our inner circle and that there are maybe people out there that uh, have been uh, damaging and abusive in our life. Lord, give us wisdom to know how to navigate these things. These things are difficult. And Lord, we thank you for your teaching and a reminder, Lord Father, that you call us, Lord, to be, uh, to be uh, reflectors of your son and to demonstrate those things in our relationships with others, Lord. Forgive us of our sins, Lord Father. Help us to be better uh, brothers and sisters and, and husbands and wives and parents and children, siblings, employees, friends, brothers, all these things, Lord, to be better for you, Lord Father. I thank you for this study and for all who have attended. We continue to lift up for those we have prayed for. And until we meet in on this Sunday, Lord Father, may you walk with us and be with us, Lord Father. For those who have uh, connected online, be with them, bless their homes and their families. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen.